Welcome to Bites of Light with Angel and Seth Rohr. Our mission is to bring bite-sized nuggets of information to be digested as you please. Take a quick bite or stay for the whole party. Pleasure being the main component of our mission, we will also bring other humans into our space to share their magical brew with us all. Love, service, and wisdom is what we are bringing to the table. Join us in our magical kitchen, where what is being served is for your highest good. Welcome to Bites of Light with Angel and Seth Rohr. Oh my goodness, we have some excitement today. We have a very special guest, one of our wolf cubs, Samantha Rohr. Welcome, welcome. Also my daughter. Also. (laughs) Also that. Also that. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Excited to talk. (laughs) Excited to talk. We got lots to talk about. So in our last episode, we just did uh, a recapitulation about our year, uh, mine and Seth's year, and some of the major transitions we went through and some of the really exciting things that we experienced. Sammy has also had a very exciting year. It's been a big (laughs) one. (laughs) And with her being a January baby, um, this year has been a very, very big year. Why don't you uh, tell us how old you turned this year and how your year started off? Yeah, so 2022, I turned 18. So that's graduating high school, going to university, kind of all the big, you know, major adult life changes. And yeah, it's been every month has had just something huge happen in it. So when we started our episode last our last episode, we started in January with us talking about that we were in Teo first, and then we went to Peru, and you were here holding down the fort. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Watching the pets, cleaning house, all the things. (laughs) Yeah. And and you had some pretty, pretty big things happen during while we were gone away. Yeah. Yeah. It taught me a lot more about like being on my own and kind of like taking care of being by myself and holding myself accountable of myself. Yeah. And we had some pet drama. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I think taking care of pets, I mean, I've been babysitting for a long time. Pets aren't much different from children. So just kind of getting used to that too. Yeah. Smooth through, set some boundaries with some pets. Yeah. (laughs) Which actually led to one of our pets leaving. Yeah. Yeah. I've had lots of pets in my life and it was definitely a unique situation. Never had to like get rid of a pet. So, yeah. Yeah. But you handled it with so much grace and ease. And even though it was stressful during the time, right. (laughs) Like you said, you've been through a lot of pets already. Yeah. Yeah. And then you turned 19, 18, 18. Yep. On the 19th. That's why my brain went there. 17. (laughs) 17. 19's coming up in in a few weeks. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of 18, 19, 17. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I turned 18 in middle of January last year. And I guess now last year. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. Entering adulthood's a weird feeling, especially when it's in the middle of your senior year of high school, because you still feel like a child, but the world's telling you you're an adult. And yeah, but it was good. It felt, turning 18 it felt good. And not a lot of my birthdays in the last few years have felt good the way that 18 did. And I think having so much to look forward to this year kind of made it feel good. Mm -hmm. That anticipation and the excitement for the year, which really helped to shape my outlook on it too. And not so much with fear, but more so, like I said, just the the excitement of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's as I've myself grown up and, and witnessed it, there's a, a point at which teenagers start to have independent thought and parents say, well, no, you still need to do what I told you so to do because you're a kid and you're my kid and I know best. Um, part of what has shifted for me in the last few years, um, I like to think has been beneficial for the kids because part of me learning that I'm responsible for my own story is learning that they're responsible for theirs. You know, as a parent, we make a commitment to do our best to provide for our children. But what does that mean? Right. And and what it's what I've come to, to know for me is it's about providing an unconditional love for them that they can 
use as a platform to then build their own story. It's not our job as parents to say, no, the story I've created is the story that you have to also adopt now because all we're doing in then is, is crushing their, their spirit and their unlimited potential to create a beautiful dream for themselves. Right. I mean, my story is not, is not your story. It's not my daughter's story. It's not even my wife's story. So when kids are going through that, they get to this point where they're like, I have all these independent thoughts and ideas and things I want to try. And parents are still putting the thumb on. I'm like, no, you live here. You got to live by my rules. And 18, because of the legal aspect of it, gives you a legal flexibility to start making decisions, right? There's no longer like the law says I have to or else I got to go to court to fight for my own independence. At 18, it's given to you by our standards here in North America. So I could see why 18 would feel like this, oh, like... <laughs> All of a sudden, I can I can choose to follow my ideas, follow my that my in, you know your inner guidance. You can yeah. say, "Oh, this is what feels good to me." And as a parent, and as as a, just a human being ex experiencing this life, the greatest gift we can give to someone else is to allow them to write their story. We can see it's okay if you see that somebody's experiment that they want to run that likely has an outcome that they're not going to like but it's not your place to rob them of that experience so because i have had that awareness drop in for me i took a big step back for my kids and i know let me correct me if i'm wrong at some point at one point they felt like i was no longer there like i had taken a step back and was no longer there to be their parent and i i think it was probably for lack of communication on my part but after we had some talks about it, it was more, I, I, I hope that I had um, conveyed that it wasn't because I wasn't there to love and support you. It's that I was no longer there to try to tell you what you should do. Unless I saw a, maybe a life safety sort of scenario come up, I might step in and be like, well, this could cost you your life. Um, but other than that, uh, 18 brings a lot of freedom yeah. now. And there is a transition with that you know, and to be witness to watching this conversation happen and you process in your own way what those words meant and what you meant as a parent. It was fascinating for me to witness your process on how you navigated that space. Yeah. So, yeah, how did you feel about that whole situation? Yeah, I think especially having two different households created a very interesting dynamic for me obviously i can't speak for my brother but for mm -hmm. me having two households that for a moment felt the same of that like absentee like no not that like strict right like you said like just shutting everything down yeah it felt the same until I processed it and until I realized no one is an absentee parent and one is the freedom for me to choose my decisions and choose how I go about life and having that freedom before I left home made leaving home and making that adjustment easier not completely easy <laughs> but easier to pick myself back up and to force myself to try new things and to be like okay with making mistakes because I knew that if I did make a mistake, I could pull myself out of it just as easy as I've pulled myself out of other stuff. And that we were right here to support you. If you yeah. Had, right. Yeah. That, that container was always there. Yeah. So, yeah, I think just processing the difference between not having support and having free support that the freedom to do your own thing and not be like micromanaged or expected to act and behave and choose specific things. Yeah, I mean, and, and to clarify, I was maybe not the polar opposite. I would like to think I wasn't a totally controlling parent, but I certainly was raised in a, in a world where I adopted the, I, there's two ways. There's the way that I do it and the wrong way. So that was where I was coming from. And my kids grew up with that for the first 
you know, majority of their life was, well, sure, you can do it wrong if you want to, but that's just stupid. Don't do it wrong. So recognizing that there's infinite ways to do things and none are right or wrong. It's merely the experience that will get out of the choices that we make um, is, is freeing to allow people to make those choices. But then they're here, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to make choices. We're here to learn. We're here to experience. And in those choices and learning and experiences is where the growth happens. And the sometimes the, the most perceivedly painful things are the things where the most growth happens. So if we rob people of something, an experience, just because we perceive it to be too painful for them to experience, it's right along the same lines of, helping that butterfly out of its of its cocoon, out of its chrysalis. And science has shown if you do that, the butterfly dies. It comes out, it falls to its death. It needs that, you know, I say perceived because is it really a struggle or is it an, a gift to that butterfly to have to use its muscles and exercise its will in its in its own ability to get out of that cocoon to then fly off? and be such a beautiful visual gift for the rest of us. And that's true for all of us. That's true for our children. If we don't give them the, that freedom to work through the, their own challenges and face their own experiences, they won't get the growth out of it. And like you said, when you went off to college, you felt like you'd had an opportunity to practice in a more safe container with some, with some safety net. And now you could go out in the world going, Okay, I've, I've kind of done this. I think I, I think I got a handle on this, and and if not, I know things will be okay anyway. Yeah, and also knowing too that I have the freedom to make my own choices and make my own mistakes and whatever, also is eye opening when you go out into the world and you meet new people, and you have to understand that they also have the freedom to make their own choices, and that doesn't make their choices wrong just because it's not what you would choose. Like, I think mm -hmm. that is also a perspective that has changed a lot of how I come to meeting a new person you know it's not like oh you're a horrible human because that's not how i would choose to act or not what i would choose to do it's just a matter of understanding we all come from different places we all come from you know different childhoods especially going into college right a lot of people it's like the first time they've ever left home right. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. the first time they've been away from their parents and so you know coming to it with that knowledge and that expectation of everybody coming from different backgrounds kind of prevents the disappointment or the misunderstandings when somebody doesn't make the same choices or makes decisions that you don't necessarily agree with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause you do have to experience unconditional love and understand that people will support you in the way you need to be able to do that for others. Yeah right, to embody that medicine and to bring it in, then you can then go on and provide that for others. Yeah. You know, and it's been, it's been amazing for me to witness watching you grow and leave the house and do all that stuff because I didn't get that opportunity with my daughter. So to be able to hold space and kind of get a do-over. Yeah. <laughs> it's been awesome. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it and like I don't ever want to say or like make it perceived that like my experience of leaving has been easy. Yeah. Like I think the opposite. Like and I think it's okay to identify it as struggle because it's hard. And I think when you try to convince yourself that something's not hard or that it shouldn't be difficult, you don't allow yourself the compassion that you deserve. And I often do that to myself of like, you shouldn't be struggling with this. This shouldn't be hard for you. You've gone through worse, right? Like I've moved 16 times in 18 years, whether it's from house to apartment or whatever, 16 times in 18 years before I moved to college. And so moving to college, I thought this should be easy, right? Like it's just, it's just another move, but then it's not because you don't have your family, you don't have the friends, you don't have the same scenery, you have to do grocery shopping by yourself and all of a sudden you forget all the food you've ever liked, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's just a matter of like, you have to do it all and it's hard and like allowing myself to understand that it's hard and that like I'm getting through it is also showing myself 
the love and the compassion that I know I deserve from myself. Hmm. Excellent. So what, what tools did you use over the last couple of months to get, get yourself here? What were some of the main things you did? Hmm. I don't know that there's like specific ones that I think like really made a difference on their own. I think it's more so a combination of everything. Um, I also, the first month I kind of shut down, like I wasn't doing things, like I was going to class and that was about it. Like didn't leave my room, didn't try to go hang out with friends, didn't try to make friends. Like I kind of just, everything in my system just retracted. And then after that, I think I finally realized what was happening and that's when I started to use the tools and the things that I've learned over the past, you know, whatever years. Um, a big one for me was forcing myself to realize that I could either struggle alone and be in my bed, or I could struggle and go to the coffee shop to study, or I could struggle and put myself out there to try to meet people. Like either way, I knew it was going to be hard, but one has the potential to benefit me and one is just wallowing. And it's kind of that a couple of years ago, my best friend asked me, like, she said, I don't know how you keep going through all these big life events and like keep walking. And I said, I have two options. I can either lay down and let life, you know, stop me in my tracks or I can get up and I can keep walking. And that's kind of, I think what I finally decided is that I wanted to get up and keep walking because I wasn't doing myself any good to just lay down and give up. It's that take action piece. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing is, like I said, holding myself accountable for my actions and for my story and deciding that I didn't want to be somebody who struggled because it was hard and I just gave up. I wanted to be somebody who struggled, recognized the struggle and worked through it. And a lot of that comes from also knowing that I've been able to get through hard things before and knowing that I have the strength to get through it because when you're struggling, it can be really easy to be like, to be hard on yourself and to, you know, feel like you can't get through it and to feel like this is too much, but knowing and allowing myself to know that I'm strong and that I can get through it, I think was also that push to like, to force me to get up and to force me to keep trying and, and try new things. And, you know, some things didn't work. Some things like trying to make friends in my classes that didn't work. I go to a big school. My classes have hundreds of people in them, right? Like trying to make friends when there's hundreds of people who switch seats every two days, you know, it's, it's hard, but joining a sorority and something I, I didn't think I was going to do, right? Like it was something that I, the notion of that I judged, but allowing myself to put my judgments and my expectations aside and do what I thought was best for me also really helped. So it sounds like instead of a tyrant inside your head, you had a cheerleader. Yeah. That self-love is strong. Yeah. And it wasn't always consistent, but yeah. I think kind of keeping myself in check and when that self-doubt and the self-criticism and, and that negativity would come in, kind of checking myself and trying to switch my attitude and switch my outlook on things really helped too. I think they said it best in Frozen when Anna, in the second one, when Anna learned the lesson of when you don't think you can go on, you just do the next best thing. You do the next right thing. You just put one step foot in front of the other. And for you, because you are an extroverted person and you like engagement with people, mm -hmm. it was, I don't feel like it, but I know that fills my cup. So I'm going to put myself out there in a way that you know, I don't feel like doing it right now. I know could have an outcome. So it's going to be different for every person right. knowing those things that usually bring you joy when you're in a place where you don't feel any joy and don't feel like doing those things doing that self-care piece like you said it's self-care doing the things you know usually bring you joy even if in the moment you're just kind of like Ugh. yeah it still can feel you feel it begin to fill you up yeah so just doing the next when i when when they say do the next right thing it's do the next right thing for you do the next right thing for your mental health, for your self-care. And by taking those steps, you 
find that one foot in front of the other turns inches into feet into miles and that before you know it you've passed so far through the thing that was holding you down that you don't even recognize anymore yeah like where, wh wait when did that even happen was that like a lifetime ago <laughs> oh that was only a couple months ago wow this is amazing yeah i think you said it too like doing what's best for you i think letting go of expectations that either were or weren't real from other people kind of releasing that and allowing myself to just focus on what i think is best for me and taking that action for myself and not allowing myself to do or not do things because i felt like i would either be judged or letting other people down or that sort of thing because you know i had to switch jobs after a month because i was miserable and i felt like I was not doing the things I should be doing and you know how can you not stick with the job for more than a month, but I knew that if I didn't. I wasn't just selling my time I was selling my happiness and selling my energy and. that's not worth it, and so I let go of the expectations I felt from others and the judgment I felt might happen and just did what was best for me and. You know, same thing with joining a sorority and just little things where I catch myself having to let go of what I feel is expected of me from others, like I said, whether it's there or not, and just doing what's best for me because at the end of the day, like, it's my life. And if I'm living for other people, then I'm not living for anybody because they have their own lives. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're the only one that can write the story of your life the way you want it to be. And if you allow other people to dictate how you're going to write it, then you're not going to have the story that brings you joy. Yeah. And it is an advanced level of awareness. You know, you and I have had that conversation a lot that, you know, where you're at, at now at 18 is light years for some. Yeah. And some will never get to the advanced level of awareness that you have right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm really happy that you came on and shared some of your yeah, experiences. Absolutely. And I think even you went and got your hair done yesterday <laughs> and it looks amazing. Yeah. And for me, it's almost an initiation, you know, because what, what was, I can't remember the exact words you said around why you wanted to do it and go back to the natural. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about it was more the so whole just, process for you? Yeah, it was more so just like, I, I was born a blonde, right? Like most people in my family were blondes <laughs> and the, first couple years of high school, my hair started getting darker. And so then I decided I wanted to dye it back to being blonde because that's what felt comfortable. That's what felt like me. It. Yeah. And then yeah. I didn't get my hair done for a few months. And anybody who dyes their hair knows that you start to get that like harsh line. And it just started to feel like dirty, you know, and like it wasn't me anymore. And so I decided like it was time to leave high school, leave childhood Sammy blonde, behind and take on kind of a new more natural i guess sense um so yeah it was just more of dividing that that chapter and moving on mm -hmm. it is an initiate an initiatory step that you took yeah you know in our language we would call it a shamanic death mm -hmm. you just rebirthed yourself yeah right yeah and i don't know if you remember when we came home from peru within a couple of weeks, I went and chopped nine inches off my hair and kind of went through the same process. Yeah. So you and so it was cool when you came home that we got to witness you doing the same thing without even really the awareness around what you were doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now here you are all yeah. rebirthed and beautiful and lovely hair and it's yeah. just a couple of days old. Yeah, no, it, I, it's true in a lot of cultures, like we hold a lot of our identity and how we look and in our hair. And I think making this step for me was more about feeling like myself and I no longer felt like who I was as a blonde and as I was dyeing my hair that color and so I just need something new and I didn't know if this was that like that move for me but I knew I needed something different and I think like you said anytime you go through a big change sometimes it's good to just wipe the slate clean mm -hmm. and that's kind of I think what this was for me is just wiping the slate clean and I just love how nonchalant you are about it because it's just so ingrained and embodied. Yeah. Because 
that's ruthless to write to wipe the slate yeah it's ruthless yeah when you've done it multiple times yeah. in such a short span of life right yeah. like 18 years old although i feel old yeah it's not it's not you know in the grand yeah. scheme of things it's a fifth of the average life yeah and i i tell people all the time i would never change the things that i've been through because like you said it's made me so much more aware yeah and it's put me so far ahead yes and while it's hard and well it hasn't been easy to process and easy to get to a point where i'm so self-aware i would not change that course because it's made me who i want to be and who, who i am now so yeah, exactly so moving forward you're here for another week yeah. And then you're back to ASU. Yeah. <laughs> have you set intent or like what's kind of because when you first went, it was just like, wow, you have so many things and you had to stay present with yourself so much because you were literally recreating a brand new storyline. Yeah. So now that you've had a couple months and now you're going back, what has shifted now leaving compared to leaving a week before when you went in August? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is now that I have routines kind of in place, obviously with each semester is a different class schedule, you know, different events, different things. So there will be some still like reestablishing routines, especially being home for a month. But I think the biggest thing is allowing myself to kind of get comfortable. I think when you spend so much time in an unfamiliar place trying to figure things out, you're kind of in a state of high frequency for so long that constant like you said constantly self-aware constantly you know aware of everything and trying to figure it out and so i think the biggest thing for me is going to be trying to figure out how to slow down and breathe yeah exactly just kind of <laughs> allow myself to get comfortable and not feel so much like an outsider looking in but more so in it you're integrating so yeah yeah well especially if i if i'm gonna spend two more years t into getting my degree in that place i need to get comfortable i don't want to spend three years of my life in a state of you know hypervigilance st stress and anxiety <laughs> yeah. and yeah and just mm -hmm. that not feel like i said feeling like an outsider and so that i think is going to be a big thing for me is just starting to like integrate this as like this is my life now I'm not just somebody who's here. It, somebody said when I first moved down, somebody said, it feels like summer camp, right? Mm. Your parents dropped you off and there's yeah. this constant feeling of like, okay, when are they gonna come get me now? And mm. now I feel like it's finally that, like that setting in of like, no, this is just life. This mm. is how it is now. And so allowing myself to get comfortable, I think is where, where I hope to get to in the next four months, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> now, to also have this type of awareness, boundaries have to be essential. Yeah. So where have you found that you've had to set some very clear boundaries to help you move to where you needed to go? Because you had a goal and you were on a mission. Yeah. So how did you navigate the outside world with yeah. boundaries? Um, I think a big thing is with one with myself, right? Not, like I said, not talking about the negative all the time and not allowing myself to be such a harsh critic and kind of holding myself accountable to my boundaries but also with my mom and with kind of the family like institution that sort of thing right like i think my generation is on a very big turnaround when it comes to challenging institutions right be it religious or political or family. And I think that one was a big one for me of people can be really close to you and not have the actions and the behaviors that are best for you. They might think it's best for you, but you have to decide that. And I think that was another big thing for me is deciding your behaviors, your beliefs and actions aren't best for me and sticking to that. and there's there tends to be a lot of judgment around that when the people that you're setting boundaries with are family and that has also been a huge thing for me getting over 
behaving and acting and making choices to other people's expectations, allowing myself to just do what I know and what I believe is best for me. And sometimes you have to readjust, right? Sometimes you set a boundary and you're like, okay, maybe, maybe that was too much. Maybe we can step back. And sometimes you set a boundary and it's still not far enough. And so I think having an experience with somebody who's so close to me and spent so much time with me, having to navigate boundaries has also set me up for going into the real world. Um, and people that aren't as close to me, I'm more prepared now to navigate boundaries just quicker. Um, and when you're able to set boundaries quicker with people, there's less of that, there tends to be less of that overstepping because you're able to be more just upfront about it. Yeah, that's a good point. Firm boundaries does not mean concrete boundaries. Right. You know, concrete meaning unchanging and, un, and unwielding as, as we go through life. Being present in the now is, is about constantly evaluating where you're at right now. We have all these beliefs that we've been given, a lot of beliefs we've come to on our own. And if you're not constantly questioning your beliefs, you know, is this, does this still serve me? Is this boundary still a boundary that serves me? Or am I just holding it because I did? Or am I just not putting it in place because I never have? So, and then it like, like Sammy said, it, you put the boundary and then you can reevaluate the boundary. And if it's like, okay, that might've been, you know, that might've pushed people back further than I intended. So I'm going to, I'm going to ease up on that one. The other big piece that comes in is when we first start taking that responsibility for our life, we may need to put really wide boundaries. We may need really closed off because we've been giving our power away to everything else. Like you said, letting other people's expectations rule you, that is giving your power away to those people. So when you start deciding that it's, I'm going to do me, as you're pulling that power back, you need these really wide boundaries. Like you need a lot of leeway and you got to really be careful what you're allowing into your world because it's, un, it's, it's kind of unstable ground. It's new. You're treading new ground as that power comes back in and you figure out your own stability. You can pull some of those boundaries back in a little closer because you have the ability to manage yourself in those environments now far better than you did before so as your power grows your boundaries are going to change too just naturally because you'll have more ability in theory you can get to a point where you can stand in a shit storm and not get any of it on you but until you have that ability to focus your will and intent steer clear of the shit storm because it'll get all over you <laughs> and that's kind of you know so part of that like what you're saying it's just reassessing those boundaries reassessing where you're at is is huge yeah, yeah especially big. especially when it comes to i think parental and child relationships because there's a mm -hmm. major shift in power dynamic especially when the kid becomes an adult and for me i not necessarily had all of the responsibilities of being adult but I've had a lot more responsibilities than most of my peers from a much younger age. And so because of that, I felt like I had a lot of that already down. And so not being treated like an adult and then becoming one, it was like you said, it just boundaries had to be set so far back because I had to reestablish where I fell basically in the food chain. And also figuring out what I was comfortable with now as an adult and as a grown human, you know, obviously life continues and you change things. Like you said, things have to ebb and flow depending on where you're at in life and where other people are at in life. Um, but for me, that transition into an adult, you know, relationship versus a child and parent relationship caused me to have to kind of step back in a large way to reassess how I wanted that to look for me. And that's the thing, you absolutely can redefine your relationships later on. Yeah. Right. And that's what you're currently doing right now. Yeah. And I think it goes with every relationship, every relationship. right? Friendships, mm -hmm. whatever. It's 
it's important, at least for me, to constantly at this stage of my life evaluate whether people are serving my life in a positive way or draining my life in a negative way. Mm-hmm. And very important. And that's not always the same. Like, one person might not always do the same thing. And that's why reevaluating boundaries with people is so important because if somebody's going through a hard time in their life, they might be more likely to drain you and it's okay to set that boundary with them. And that's another thing I've learned is like, just because somebody is currently behaving in a way that I don't want, doesn't make my relationship with them have to be over. Right. Boundaries have to be set to protect myself, but that doesn't make it my fault. It doesn't make it the end of the relationship at large. Yeah, and, and to expand on the, the boundaries idea is as we recognize that we have the ability and the right to set our own boundaries, if we want people to respect those boundaries, we have to respect other people's boundaries. So something that we had a conversation about the other night that was kind of funny for most of us was about consent. Yeah. So consent is often discussed about with, you know, particularly with with sex like you know is it consensual um sammy brought up a new concept that was what's the it's enthusiastically it's an enthusiastic yes or it's a no yeah enthusiastic yes so consent is an enthusiastic yes so like a a a mumbly thing is not okay and but this doesn't have to just be with sex right when somebody comes to us or we're, we're in their life and we see that they're doing something that maybe we are perceiving as leading to a place that will cause them pain, we could say, would you like, would you be okay if I offered my perspective? You know, would you be interested in some advice, right? And if we do that, um, we're still asking for that consent to cross a boundary. Like obviously the physical boundary of having sex, that's, that's important in respecting people's personal space and, you know, the, the sacredness of, of, you know, their body and, and their own and their spirit. But that carries over to all of the boundaries. And by by preframing with instead of just, hey, you're doing this wrong. Well, you know, what does that do to you when I say that? Right. Automatically, you're like, OK, whoa, defenses are up. I'm no longer listening. I'm, you know, so if we can approach all boundaries, all of other people's boundaries with looking for that enthusiastic yes because if they say if you're like hey would you mind if i shared my perspective with this with you and they're kind of like oh yeah so don't bother that's not (laughs) that is not an enthusiastic yes (laughs) and if they're but if they're like yes i would actually love that because i'm feeling a little lost and confused on this cool then let's have a conversation so that enthusiastic yes is permission to interject your thoughts into their story or your actions into their story. It doesn't just have to be about, you know, personal and sexual relations. And I think if that is, if we adopt that enthusiastic, yes, we're one gonna save ourselves a lot of headache because when you try to interject into somebody else's story without their permission, you push them further away. Um, I had a theory that I'm very fortunate, I feel very fortunate to have found, which, we discussed earlier, I mean, when I introduced it, as I implemented it, the communication wasn't good and Sammy felt like I had withdrawn from her. But I had this theory that we've all witnessed teenagers and parents go through this phase of um, arguing and I hate you and I wish you were out of my life. And by the time these teenagers go off to college, the parents are like, good, get the hell out of here. The kids are like, good, I can't stand the side of your face. And I just, I had this theory that this is because of the parents continued desire to control their children to subjugate their children to their to the to the parents story and the kids increasing discomfort with that as they're growing into their own as they're having their own ideas and that is why i stepped back to allow my kids to create their own story And to my recollection, we've never had any, I hate you's get out of my face in this house. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's true in, you know, with at your mom's house or not, but 
I've witnessed the alternative and put this into practice and there was no, we didn't have that because I wasn't trying to subjugate Sammy to my idea of what life should be like. And when I had something to offer, it could be taken as here's an idea, take it or leave it if it serves you. So enthusiastic, yes. Consent is, is, is a thing that we can apply throughout all of life's experience yeah. with those around us. And I think in doing so, you'll actually find that people are far more receptive and your kids will be far more receptive to the things you have to say when it's not a, I'm right, you're wrong. It's a, here's, a, here's an alternative option if you're willing to hear it, if you're interested at this time. I also think it goes the other way too. If if somebody is approaching a boundary of yours or inviting you to do something or whatever it is, if there's a yes or no thing presented to you, is it an enthusiastic yes for you? Do you want that to be, do you want to do that? Are you okay with that boundary being crossed? And if it's not an enthusiastic yes, then it's a no. It's not worth putting your energy into things that you aren't fully invested in and fully excited for that's mm -hmm. not it's a waste of time and it's a waste of energy yeah we we talk about that because it's not just it's not just are you going to say yes or no you're you're always saying yes to something the question is are you saying yes to giving your time and energy to other things or are you saying yes to giving it to yourself because a yes to some things and no to something else if I say yes to this activity that I don't really want to do, but I feel obligated to, I've just said no to using that time and energy for something that can create more expansion in my own life or that of other people. So that's part of that, like we've talked about before, knowing your yes is probably more important than knowing your no, because if it's not, if you don't get that full body yes, that full green light, then it is a no, it's like a no. Sammy was saying. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a gut wrenching, oh my God, this could be life threatening no. If it's not that full yes, everything else is a no, and then you leave the space in your life for magic. And if you've been following our other episodes, we spend a lot of time talking about following your intuition, listening to your body. Your body will tell you what yes means. Mm -hmm. And it does take practice. You know, if we circle back to the boundaries and how long do you leave the boundaries in and while you're experimenting, every time you go through a huge shift in your life, you will want to go inward and push your boundaries out. There is this ebb and flow with boundaries. If you have just hard cemented, put a boundary in, that means there's work there. That means you need to lean into whatever you're putting that concrete wall up for. There's medicine there for you. Mm -hmm. So learning to be flexible. I call it strengthening your spiritual muscles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right sometimes it's anaerobic sometimes it's aerobic are you going to go hardcore or are you going for the long haul it all depends and every situation is different so if you can be agile with your boundaries and stay centered and always always connected to yourself you'll know your body will tell you it's about getting out of here and coming into your heart and listening to your body mm -hmm. your body knows what yes means yeah and i think I think that's the other thing for me about the like enthusiastic yes is if it's not an enthusiastic yes, reflecting why. Is it, are you saying yes, even though it's not enthusiastic because you feel like it's bad if you don't or somebody will judge you or you're letting somebody else down or is it you feel like if you do it, it might please somebody else or whatever. It's, it's a lot of that self-reflection still of like, if I'm saying yes, but I'm not, I don't want to say yes, why and analyzing that and adjusting boundaries to that and you know and like you said sometimes it changes and sometimes it's i'm burnt out or i have something that is going to get me farther and towards what my goals are than this right now but next week when i have less classwork or less family stuff i'm all in and it's just voicing that and communicating that with people, because if you don't communicate what your boundaries are, they're a lot more likely to get overstepped mm -hmm. and to to have those, you know, misunderstandings. So 
Well, and it is about practice. This is a lifelong practice that humans have to go through their whole lives. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it just reminds me of the four agreements, always do your best. And every single day, your best is going to be different. And if you're cheerleading yourself and you're supporting yourself and you have that self-love and you're staying with yourself, what you're doing will always be what's in your best interest, always. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you guys for having me talk. <laughs> We're hoping that uh, we can do this again when you come home next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck in your next semester. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Lots of good stuff in 2023. Yes. All right. Until the next episode, all my love. All my love. Take care. Thank you for sharing your time with us. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, and leave a ratings and review. Hey, did you know that both Angel and Seth have books coming out in 2023? Stay tuned and follow us on all social media platforms at Bites of Light, B-Y-T-E-S-O-F-L-I-G-H-T. Thanks again, and we look forward to sharing space with you again soon. Mm -hmm.